Sehr geehrter Herr Bundeskanzler, lieber Kurt Firmetz, liebe Frau Firmetz, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture, Kurt Firmetz lecture. I'm more than pleased to have been asked to introduce uh, uh, Fred Bergstein as today's speaker. And I'd like to say a little bit about him and also a little bit about the Euro crisis. Now, Fred is, and that's probably one of his most important jobs, is a member of the President's Advisory Committee on Trade Policy and Negotiations. He is a senior fellow and director emeritus of uh, the Peterson Institute, and many of you will remember Adam Posen, who spoke here uh, not too long ago, uh, where he served at the Peterson Institute uh, for more than 30 years. And today, he is also a member of the advisory committee of the Expert Input Bank, and Fred is co-chairman of the private sector advisory group of the United States India Trade Policy Forum. Now, all of these positions have brought Fred, uh, Fred a full circle as he started his career in government service. Uh, by the way, um, as I just learned, Fred wrote uh, 43 books on international economics, and he is going to read them all to us tonight. <laughs> his, um, now, while he was in government was service, his thing. previous government posts include Assistant Secretary for International Affairs of the U.S. Treasury from 1977 to 81. You have to correct me if I say silly things. He was Under Secretary for Monetary Affairs from 1980 to 1981. And at the very beginning of his career, if I may add, he was Assistant for International Economic Affairs to Henry Kissinger, which makes him a bipartisan, uh, independent um, member of government because he worked both for Republican and Democrat um, governments. And it was, it was actually Henry Kissinger who said, and I quote him, if you don't know where you're going, every road will get you nowhere, end of quote. And this is particularly true in times of crisis, and it kind of leads me to the topic of this evening's lecture. In March of uh, 2010, um, the euro crisis is considered to have broken out, and the starting shot for the sovereign debt crisis here in the euro area, uh, was fired when euro area countries agreed to finally support uh, stumbling Greece, as you will all remember. Today, more than four years later, we finally see a silver lining on the horizon. The reforms that were undertaken have begun to bear fruit, and economic growth in the euro area has picked up again, and we are no longer in recession, but we are growing in the euro area. However, we are not out of the woods, as of yet, there are still kind, quite of a number of risks to recovery. And I would like to name a couple of those risks I see. One of the major risks, I think, is complacency and reform fatigue. This is the real threat, because there still are quite a number of structural problems that remain unresolved not only at the national level, at the countries of the euro area themselves, but also at the European level. Let me cite something Fred uh, wrote in 2012, which I think is very relevant for tonight's lecture, and I quote him. At its core, the euro area crisis is about national sovereignty and the process in which European governments can agree to transfer it to new required euro area institutions governing banking sectors and fiscal policies." End of quote. In my view, this captures the central issue rather well. There are institutional imbalances in the setup of the euro area. Now, having said that, the banking union is probably the most uh, and biggest and most important step since the introduction of the euro as a single currency. And it's the most logical step at the same time. A single currency requires integrated financial markets, and this, of course, includes an integrated harmonized supervision and also potentially resolution of banks. The upcoming European banking supervision regime and the European resolution mechanism for banks will certainly help, we think, to rebalance the institutional setup of the euro area. Nevertheless, another institutional imbalance remains and is kind of active. Now, while monetary policy is decided by the governing council of the ECB in Frankfurt, and actually 
the Governing Council took a decision today. So monetary policy is conducted in Frankfurt. Fiscal policies are a matter for national policymakers. Each country, as you are well aware, decides itself on its own government revenues and expenditures. Well, given such an imbalance of responsibilities, the individual countries actually do have incentives to borrow and what we as economists call a deficit bias emerges. Now one option to realign this imbalance would be to transfer control over national budgets to the European level, thereby creating a fiscal union. I think this is what Fred meant by national sovereignty. This option would require member states to transfer this national sovereignty to the European level. But such a change would be rather a radical change, and I think it would need a raft of amendments to national and European legislation. And more than anything, such a change would need the support, not only of the parliaments and of the policymakers, but also of the general public. And on this point, um, I urge you all to be realistic. I don't see anywhere whether in Germany or in any other country in Europe, a will to give up national sovereignty right now. Again, neither in Germany nor in any other country of the euro area, which means that it leaves us with a second option, leaving control over fiscal policies at the national level in the countries themselves, while at the same time strengthening the rules on borrowing, as it was set out in the Maastricht Treaty. Actually, for now, this is the course that has been chosen and the course we are walking. The rules of the Stability and Growth Pact have been tightened. Now they have to be applied and they also have to be complied with. To sum up, the situation in the euro area has certainly improved, as I would argue, but risks remain and kind of a number of structural problems still need to be resolved. Against this backdrop, Possible ways in which Germany, our country, could address these issues are being discussed frequently. I am therefore really eager to hear what Fred has to say on Germany and the Euro, the revenge of Helmut Schmidt, because it's quite important to hear from the outside how we as Germany can contribute. But let me make a final remark. USA Today once listed Fred as one of the 10 people who can change your life. USA Today. This certainly raises the bar for this lecture and for you. <laughs> and I'm certain that Fred will rise to this occasion. Thank you very much for your attention. And Fred, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, Andreas, thank you very much for that very kind introduction and also for some things you did not say. <laughs> it is true that USA Today once said, I was one of the 10 people that could change your life, along with the guy who invented the internet, not Al Gore, uh, the guy who identified the ozone layer, and a few others. But the full quote went as follows. These are the 10 people who could change your life that you never heard of. <laughs> And I suspect that the second part is more accurate than the first part. Andreas also mentioned that I once was economic deputy to Henry Kissinger. Once when I was introduced as having had that honor, my introducer said, and that is like being military advisor to the Pope. <laughs> I made that comment on a program with Kissinger a couple of years ago, and he said, that is correct. <laughs> he said, and Fred went on to have a distinguished career in the Carter administration, something quite difficult to have achieved. <laughs> so as usual, Henry gets the last word. I deeply appreciate this invitation tonight to speak here at the Academy, especially as the Kurt Biermitz Distinguished Fellow. I'll be spending a couple of weeks here with my wife, Jenny. And Kurt, to you, to the Academy as a whole, 
I want to say my deep appreciation. Berlin is my favorite city in the world. Been here 40, 50 times in my life, I suppose. And I actually had the great good fortune to attend the conference, I spoke to it, back in 1994, at which the Academy was launched with Henry Kissinger and particularly my close friend Richard Holbrook. Uh, Jenny and I stayed with Dick Holbrook and his residence in Bonn while he was ambassador. He was one day younger than I am. We were colleagues on the softball field as well as in the field of diplomacy. I know you had a memorial service for him here. I had the great privilege to attend the memorial service for him at the Kennedy Center in Washington, which was one of the most remarkable events that my wife and I ever attended. It was addressed by at least two presidents. Now I say at least two presidents because it was addressed by Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, but it was also addressed by Hillary Clinton. So maybe, and if you put the odds at 50-50, two and a half presidents speaking for Holbrook, which even by Holbrook's standards was pretty impressive. I also want to say how deeply honored I am by the presence here of Chancellor Schmidt. I had the enormous privilege to both work with him and sometimes to spar with him a little bit over the years. As I think back over my career of many years in this business, I had the great, great privilege to work with four people that I think are among the greatest statesmen of the second half of the 20th century. And my boss Kissinger in the White House, Paul Volcker, who licked inflation and the third world debt crisis. Lee Kuan Yew, with whom I had the opportunity to work out some of the economic architecture of the Asia Pacific region. And Chancellor Schmidt, who among many other things was of course the father or one of the fathers of the Euro, one of the architects of the evolution of the European Union and who I can testify from an hour and a half that we spent together today is in phenomenal shape at age 95 and truly one of the great statesmen of our time. And I'd like to invite the audience. To... I suspect the chancellor will not agree with everything I say tonight. He might not agree with anything. I say tonight, but I do want to dedicate my remarks to him and I put his name in the title in a somewhat mischievous way that I will explain a little later. As most of you probably know, all my friends here certainly know, I was one of the very few prominent American economists who supported the Euro. I thought it was a good idea. I thought it would launch on time. There was a great debate about that, you may remember. I predicted fearlessly that it would succeed, it would be a strong currency, and indeed over the years would move up alongside the dollar as a major world currency. All of those predictions, except perhaps the last, has occurred already, and I still think the last will occur as well. Throughout the crisis of the last few years, I and a very few colleagues, very few, unswervingly predicted that the Euro would successfully resolve its crisis, Defining that as no breakup of the Eurozone, no exits from the zone, no disorderly defaults, that is admittedly a low bar, but even though I did not, I, and I did not foresee a rapid return to growth or rapid completion of the economic union, but the crisis was existential. There were, of course, apocalyptic forecasts prevalent. I'd say a majority, at least in the United States, predicted that the Euro would fall. So I feel justified in declaring at least partial and modest victory. But the point for tonight is just to remind all of you that this record should qualify me as one of the strongest and most consistent supporters of the Euro. And uh, in short, I am with you here in Europe and in Germany in this fantastically important project. But the interesting question for tonight, or well, first important question, is why did the Euro survive the crisis? Why were so many analysts wrong? The reason, I think, is simple. Most analysts, at least in the United States and Britain, were using the wrong analytical model. 
Virtually all economists were relying on what we call the theory of optimal currency areas, saying that a monetary union could only work if countries met certain tests, like having free mobility of labor, which Europe has to a large extent, but also having a regular fiscal transfer mechanism, which, as Andreas mentioned, Europe does not yet have, and certainly did not have at the outset of the crisis. Now, Chancellor Schmidt, the other founding fathers knew they were creating a monetary union that did not have all of the theoretical constructs. They thought that the creation of the monetary union would lead inexorably to the further steps necessary to complete the economic union. But times were good in the early 2000s. There was no pressure from the markets to proceed. And so when the crisis broke, the house was only half full. So when the crisis hit, most of the experts, seeing the absence of the criteria for an optimum currency area, felt confident that the euro would collapse. By contrast, I and my few friends used a political economy model. We knew that the overriding post-war goal of all the major countries in Europe was to integrate the continent avoid the repetition of past disasters via the integration project, and that the euro had now become both the main substance and the main symbol of that project, and therefore it would not fail. This overriding geopolitical determination was of course particularly prevalent here in Germany. As the main source of the historical disturbances which would never, never let itself be blamed for again destroying Europe. And according to the recent accounts of decision-making during the crisis that appeared recently in the Financial Times, Chancellor Merkel apparently thought of it in exactly those terms and went on to say that the failure of the euro would mean the failure of the Europe, of Europe. Now, there was a critical corollary of this logic which was unpopular when I said it during the crisis, maybe still unpopular here in Germany. The corollary I drew was that Germany would pay whatever was necessary, repeat, whatever was necessary to preserve the euro, and that the European Central Bank would do so as well with the support and approval of this country. I don't want to tell tales out of school, but when I met today with Minister Schäuble, he did not deny that that was a correct interpretation of the evolution of policy during this period. And my conclusion, to repeat, was that there was zero chance of failure of the euro and the eurozone defined in the ways I did. Now, of course, for the first couple of years of the crisis, neither the German government nor the ECB was willing to say that they would pay whatever was necessary. And that left the markets somewhat uncertain. In my view, the Germans and the ECB were correct to do that because it kept the pressure on the deficit countries to adjust. A little less admirably, the Germans were trying to share out the burden of financing with others, like other surplus countries and the ECB and even the IMF and the rest of the world. Um, but they kept the pressure on. I always said, Watch what they do, not what they say. And what they did at every critical stage of the crisis was to pay whatever was necessary to get over that hurdle and avoid the risk of failure. Now, two years ago, of course, Mario Draghi changed all that for the European Central Bank when he then said, we will do whatever is necessary. And in my view, that ushered in phase two of the crisis. Phase one was the initial couple of years or so where they were doing the right thing but not saying it. Phase two, now they're saying it. And so the markets are settled and most people agree that the crisis phase has ended. What I will suggest tonight is that it's time for a phase three of responding to the crisis where the focus is no longer on financing the adjustments, but on achieving the adjustment in real economic terms to bring down the imbalances and the difficulties 
and thereby to get restored growth in this continent, which at the moment is the great lacking variable. Now, before I suggest what the phase three could look like, I want to emphasize that, in my view at least, Germany has a second overwhelming reason for its unlimited support of the euro, including via the European Central Bank. That is, of course, this country's overwhelming economic interest in the euro. Some analysts, like my successor Adam Posen at our Peterson Institute, who said he would be watching this by live stream, hello Adam if you were there, um, he likes to put it in terms of the heavy exposure of the German banks to the countries in the periphery and argues that bailouts of those countries are really bailouts of, European, of German banks so that Germany maintains its own financial stability by providing support, even unlimited support, to the debtor countries. I prefer to focus on the real side of the economies, not the financial side. And that leads to my subtitle, The Revenge of Helmut Schmidt. Germany is, of course, the number one exporting and surplus country in the world, more than China, more than the United States. Germany is the export world master. It has relied on export-led growth throughout the post-war period, going back to the time when we worked together. Exports uh, have been the only constant source of growth in the German economy over the last 10 years. In seven of those last 10, domestic demand actually rose less than the economy as a whole. Imports dropped last year, 2013. I sometimes chide my German friends that they seem to like external demand but are not so keen to promote domestic demand. And the external surplus has stabilized at over 6% a year for the last three years. It actually rose to 8% at the end of last year, almost as high as the Chinese surplus ever got. And the German surplus is almost $100 billion more in dollar terms than the Chinese surplus, despite being a smaller economy. And Germany will soon again be the world's number one creditor country, like it was before reunification but it's headed back to that position again as a result of all these surpluses. So the German economy, with this very heavy dependence on trade and exports in particular, is very sensitive to exchange rate issues and the level of the exchange rate that governs its price competitiveness in the world economy. And that leads me to Chancellor Schmidt, because back in the day when he was running this country so well, he and other German leaders would routinely express dismay at the typical cycle of the German economy. What would happen is that Germany would get into an export boom, which would lead the overall economy to a stronger position. But then the exchange rate of the Deutsche Mark would shoot up, and that would undermine, to some extent, the competitiveness of the economy, growth would slip back, job creation was not as rapid or might even decline, and so there was some unhappiness about the way it worked. Chancellor Schmidt would then complain, sometimes loudly, about the weakness of the dollar. Now, to be sure, there were some occasions on which there was generalized weakness of the dollar. And I will not pretend that the United States had any monopoly on good policies or international competitiveness. But sometimes it was a generalized strengthening of the Deutsche Mark against virtually all currencies, including others in Europe. And there were at least four Schmidt cycles, as I will call them, of that type in the mid-70s, the late 70s, the mid to late 80s, the mid to late 90s. Strong exports, booming economy, rise of the Deutsche Mark, and some adjustment. This time, there has been no adjustment. The German surplus has risen to all-time record levels. It has stayed there now for a period of time that is unprecedented. The European Commission, which is not usually too critical of Germany, its paymaster has said this is structural, it's likely to continue. <laughs> 
the IMF predicts it's going to continue into the indefinite future that it predicts. And so there is a question of what has happened and what has changed. Now, of course, this time there is no Deutschmark to go up to achieve the adjustment of the German surplus. And the euro is a very different animal than the Deutschmark ever was. And so what I'm suggesting is that the advent of the euro is the revenge of Helmut Schmidt. Because the German exchange rate now reflects the economies of the weak European countries as well as Germany itself and the other strong countries. And so Germany, in purely economic terms, has the best of both worlds. It runs the world's biggest trade surplus, and it does not suffer from a significant rise in the value of its currency. It can have views as to whether the euro itself is overvalued or undervalued, but it surely has not gone up like the Deutsche Mark or a Neue Deutsche Mark, had the eurozone broken up, would do so. From a pure economic standpoint, we can analyze that the Deutsche Mark, if it still existed, would have gone up at least 20% and probably more. And analyses that were done at the height of the crisis suggested that if the eurozone broke up, a Neue Deutsche Mark would go up at least 40% and probably more. And so that is the difference that the advent of the euro makes for German competitiveness, the German trade surplus, the strength of the German economy, and its durability, as opposed to the adjustment cycle that I mentioned in the past. I don't know if Chancellor Schmidt had this in mind when uh, he and G. Scar and a few others led the way to the creation of the euro, but I think that all German elites, many people in this room, in the government, in the private sector, in the labor unions, all understand this phenomenon. And so I would argue there is a second reason, in addition to the traditional geopolitical and historical basis for European integration, there is a second reason why there is no chance, no chance, that Germany would ever let the euro fail and revert to national currencies. So this reinforces my conclusion that Germany will pay whatever is necessary to hold the euro together and to keep these advantages that it has achieved. But as usual, when things sound too good to be true, they may be too good to be true. In this case, the risk is of political pushback from elsewhere in Europe to the perception, which I fear is growing, but I'll be fascinated by comments tonight from all of you, by perceptions that, quote, the euro works only for Germany. Because Germany is an island of stability, growth, high employment, dynamic advance, while truth be told, virtually all of the rest of Europe languishes in high unemployment, slow growth, and unsatisfactory economic conditions. Maybe this was a key factor, at least an important factor, in the recent elections for the European Parliament, where anti-Euro sentiment begins to arise. I don't suggest that anything dramatic is going to happen overnight. The center has held politically in all of the debtor countries through the crisis. Amazingly so, although that was also one of my predictions. But the potential risk, I think, of a continuation of this situation where Germany is so isolated in its success and through a dimension and mechanism these trade imbalances that we can clearly see is very risky for Europe as a whole, particularly for Germany itself. As Andreas said, one cannot be complacent. Now, this anxiety about Europe working only for Germany, I think, takes three or four different forms. One is the view that uh, Germany itself is not generating 
adequate demand to support growth in the Eurozone as a whole. A second is the asymmetry in European decision-making between the surplus and deficit countries. Um, if you run a deficit beyond 3%, you get penalized. You have to run a surplus above 6%, twice as much to even get monitored, and then not much happens. That's a big asymmetry. Third, there's a lack of structural reform in the surplus countries, even to rebalance in the direction of more domestic demand growth, whereas the deficit countries are hammered every day to do structural reform. And fourth, fiscal policy comes under increasingly rigorous disciplines, whereas monetary policy at the European Central Bank has at least, not until now, maybe today, changes it a bit, European Central Bank has not come under discipline for failing to meet its cardinal target of keeping the inflation rate at around 2%. It's been a lot lower than that. So these asymmetries and differences, I think, fuel this concern. In purely economic terms, I think one has to acknowledge that Germany is the source of much of the Euro crisis. I realize it's an unpopular thing to say here in Germany, I'm trying to step back as an economist and analyze what are the sources of the underlying problems. First and foremost are the famous unit labor cost differences, which Jean-Claude Trichet and many others have broadcast over Europe all through the crisis. I don't have a PowerPoint or a screen here tonight, but when you look at those charts, they're dramatic. Unit labor costs in Germany have been unchanged for the 12 year life of the euro. Unit labor costs in most of the other countries have gone up about 10%. There are a couple of outliers that are higher, Greece, maybe Portugal. But in economic terms, what that says, of course, is that there is one outlier. And it's not the deficit countries, it's Germany. So German success has been at the root of the problem. Again, unpopular to say in Germany, where virtue is a great virtue, but that is, in fact, the economic case. When you look at data provided by the ECB itself, it clearly suggests that the real exchange rate of Germany, not the euro, but of Germany within the eurozone, declined by almost 20%, from the start of the euro until now. A decline of 20% strengthening the competitive position of Germany against its main partners. And that, of course, was due largely to very low wage increases. Indeed, German real wages have been flat, zero change, throughout the life of the euro, actually declined last year in 2013, and all this has led to very low inflation throughout Germany and therefore strengthening German competitiveness in this dramatic way. What this implies, of course, is that Germany has experienced a huge internal devaluation of a real exchange rate over this extended period of time. Now, this internal devaluation of the euro period is usually justified by a, an alleged need to reverse the internal upward revaluation of the mark prior to the creation of the euro. But in fact, recent studies, again using official data, show that the DM was already weaker in 1998 at the eve of the euro than it was in 1980, fully 20 years before. And the result is a huge undervaluation of the real exchange rate of Germany in the European and world economy. In short, Germany dramatically overdid its reaction to fears that it would lose competitiveness, lose economic strength in the wake of reunification in the early 1990s. And the result was, as I suggest, but of course, Germany does not have its own exchange rate. So it cannot be directly criticized by the G7 or the G20, the IMF. Um, the United States Treasury tries sometimes. 
But in fact, it's pretty hard to criticize the exchange rate of a country that does not have an exchange rate. And so that is the dilemma that others face. It should be a, an issue for the Eurozone itself, but as I said before, Germany is the paymaster. It's a little hard to criticize your, uh, your creditor. Uh, Hillary Clinton always used to say it's hard for the U.S. to criticize China too much. They're our banker and they finance us, and uh, somewhat the same within Europe. Uh, as a result, when Europe set up these new rules for monitoring imbalances, it, uh, it required a 6% ceiling for surpluses to even come under surveillance, but Germany has now surpassed that for three years running, looks like continuing, uh, and so even that generous limit has been met. So I regard this as completing the revenge of Helmut Schmidt. Not only does Germany have the best of all worlds in economic terms, but it can't be criticized. <laughs> because, because it is protected by being part of the Eurozone. And so there is no way to get at it the way people have at least tried to get at China and the other large surplus countries. Now all that leads then to the final and most important question. Is this situation desirable or even viable for Europe? for the world economy, and for Germany itself. That seems to me the crucial policy question that all of you in Germany need to be facing right now. It is certainly true technically that Germany could run huge surpluses forever and keep financing the rest of the Eurozone forever as it has for the last few years. But that, of course, would mean that the other countries would have to do all the adjusting because they would from time to time inevitably come under financial pressure and internal political pressure as well. If all the adjustment comes via the deficit countries, that means reduced growth there, and that means continued very low, possibly zero growth for the Eurozone as a whole. Continued low German inflation means that the other countries have to deflate, because how else can they improve their price competitiveness? And it adds further to the likely outcome of very low or zero growth for most of the member countries, and indeed for the zone as a whole. And so, on the view that maybe the Eurozone does work only for Germany, such approaches would be exacerbating, and I'm afraid, underlining that risk. And all this could then threaten the sustainability of the euro over time, which would be hugely ironic if having come through the crisis, a failure to deal with the underlying problems would then lead to a failure over time. It's almost inevitable there will be pushback from others both political and economic, particularly as historical memories of the geopolitical basis for Europe and the Eurozone fade, and the economic issues become more dominant and perhaps more deeply entrenched. Incidentally, all this would also dampen global economic growth. Europe is the largest single entity in the world economy, the EU as a whole, 500 million people, bigger than the US, bigger than China, and so, a continued stagnation, or worse yet, zero growth in Europe, will dampen the world economy, and that makes it a legitimate issue for the G7, the G20, the IMF. The external position of the Eurozone as a whole has already moved from minus, its current account, minus 1% of GDP prior to the crisis, to 3% surplus now. That's a 4% swing in the biggest economic entity in the world, which is already a big drag on the rest of the world economy. And if that continues, as the IMF predicts it will, then the global implications are also poor. The bottom line of all this, I think, is twofold. First, Germany has done a fantastic, terrific job in steering the Eurozone through the crisis to date. 
it would pay whatever was necessary, directly, indirectly through the ECB, and it did save Europe from another crisis. And for that, Europe owes Germany an incalculable debt, as do all of us around the world. But secondly, Germany now faces the same choice that any surplus country faces. It can either finance its borrowers and keep the imbalances going as long as they'll keep going, or it can promote more active adjustment of the imbalances to try to reduce the underlying source of the problem, respond to the political pushback, <laughs> respond to the concerns that all of this is really primarily for the benefit of Germany. And so I would urge my friends in Germany in closing to undertake a major new effort to adjust and reduce their own imbalance, particularly in favor of their partners within Europe, but the world more broadly. I think the monetary easing steps that were announced today by the European Central Bank will help, should at least provide a bit of a spur for faster domestic demand growth in Germany. I think the increase in the minimum wage by the new coalition government should help to some extent. Income tax cuts would help. In particular, increased public investments by the German government would be extremely valuable. Germany now does much less than other major economies in the world, including others in Europe, in terms of public investment. It could double or more the share of its economy going in that direction with very favorable economic effects. It does need to modify the debt break in the Constitution to adopt an investment budget separate from the current spending budget that almost every other country in the world has and every one of the states in the United States has, although the U.S. federal government is another outlier which does not have it. So there are many steps that could be taken and I think should become the new economic policy strategy of this government to deal with these more fundamental problems. If those steps can be taken, it would help greatly to assure that the Eurozone, in a third phase of response to the crisis, and under continued and indeed reinforced leadership of Germany, will do more than just survive the crisis, but will put Europe back on a viable and sustainable path that would create, over time, an optimum currency area. If all that can be done, the grand vision of Chancellor Schmidt and his colleagues will be fully realized and provide a permanent legacy to his wisdom and leadership. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll have the pleasure of moderating the Q&A session. My name is Klaus Tigges. I'm the head of Bundesbank's regional office here in Berlin. We do have a microphone. I would uh, kindly ask that you wait for the microphone and then briefly state your name and affiliation so we all know who's asking the smart questions. So who, who wants to make a start? So my name is Rudolf Delius. I'm from Bielefeld. I'm one of the great benefiter of um, the euro. We are, we are an industrial company who used to suffer from what you call the Helmut Schmidt cycle. Whenever we had uh, entered a market, Italy or France, they devalued and we were out of business again. Um, I follow your thoughts completely, um, but I wonder, um, looking at um, the AFD, looking at people who are not AFD voters, but um, the general public, 
I don't see support for what you are um, asking us to do for increasing deficit spending, for increasing public spending, um, for um, alternatively supporting uh, the southern European countries at a stronger rate. I do think all that is necessary, but I don't see um, either a public debate in that favor nor um, the willingness of the German public to, to follow such ideas. So if my pessimism is right, how will the whole thing end? Um, I suspect you're right in your political assessment, but political assessments can change actually quite rapidly, and we've seen that in many countries. But it only changes with leadership to promote the change. And again, I'm looking at Chancellor Schmidt, who was one of the great leaders that this country and the world has experienced in the last 50 years. In his leadership experience, it was necessary to educate the German public on some very important issues, and he did it. You have a powerful chancellor in office now who I think has cautiously but effectively led the positive response to the crisis that I described, and who I think, using stories like your own as case in point, could begin to change opinion. If I'm right, then the biggest loser from continuing the status quo would be Germany. For the reasons I outlined, the huge economic benefits to Germany and the historical legacy could all really, really come into great jeopardy if these more constructive adjustments are not made. And of course, it would have to be put that way to the German public, that it was in Germany's own interest to ease up a little bit on some of its traditional values and virtues in order that there be a true Europe within which Germany was the leading part, but only a part. And it was not just Germany for us Germans, but Germany in Europe for us Europeans the famous statements from the past. It would require, I think, an important educational job. But again, if I'm right that all German elites kind of understand the stakes, I would actually think leadership from the top could begin to mobilize the kind of support that would be necessary in the media, in academic and intellectual circles, uh, and then transcribed into political circles. Uh, to begin to change these policies. I put it in terms of a package. Here are half a dozen things you could do. You don't have to do them all at once. I think if Germany began to move in one or two areas that clearly demonstrated that it wanted to help its partners and neighbors adjust, reduce their deficits without forcing them into stagnation and high unemployment, then I think attitudes would begin to change and you would have time to do it. You wouldn't have to do it all at once. So, uh, and even modest changes might begin to change these attitudes that could otherwise be so poisonous. So, uh, I would not despair. I'll give you one example from my <laughs> long career. Um, in 1986, uh, you may remember in 1985, there was a famous agreement on currencies called the Plaza Agreement. And the dollar had gotten way overvalued, Mark was way undervalued, but everybody agreed to that. So the G5, G7 of the day agreed, and so there was a big initiative to move the uh, dollar down and the Deutsche Mark, again, of the European currencies up. That was working very well. But just at that time, there were some major new players in the world economy what we then called the NICs, the newly industrialized countries. This was Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. And they were not part of this plaza agreement. So they kept their currencies pegged to the dollar. I'm gonna just intervene to say, I know Chancellor Schmidt has to leave to catch his train to Hamburg. Let me again thank you, Mr. Chancellor, for having been with us tonight.
I finish my story. <laughs> These newly industrialized countries were not part of the Plaza Agreement. So they kept their currencies pegged to the dollar. Dollar went down 50%. They went down 50%. And all of a sudden, they began running massive surpluses. Well, I happened to go to Korea, which was the biggest of them about the time. And I met the senior advisor to the president on economic policy in the Blue House, as they call it. And I said, you know, you have to start thinking of yourself as a surplus country and start adjusting to this new situation. All the other Koreans in the room were horrified at the thought, you know, here's Korea's weak developing country, low income, export led growth for a couple, three decades. How can you say we should let our exchange rate go up? The senior advisor to the president said, you're right. I'm going to stake out an hour on primetime television tonight. Would you please come with me and explain that to the Korean people? Well, it was pretty hard for me to explain it to the Korean people, <laughs> partly because my Korean was not too good. <laughs> but the point was that he wanted me to help launch that, and then he took the ball. And sure enough, over the next year or two, they adjusted, let their exchange go up 30 40%, and adjusted to their new status as a surplus country. Now, that's a little more, <clears throat> more dramatic in one sense, not as dramatic in other senses. But it was an example where public opinion was changed, and a country's policies changed diametrically once it realized where its real interests lay in the longer run. So I would not despair. Can I add? Sir, can I ask you to, uh, to talk shop once more? Are you going to appear on TV tomorrow night with Schäuble? <laughs> He didn't go quite so far as to ask me to do that. <laughs> when I said he did not, I don't want to be reported out of context. Uh, when I said he did not object, neither did he stand up and cheer. Uh, so, uh, but I have a lot of faith in him, actually. I think he's been a hero in responding to this crisis. And uh, so uh, I have great faith in the leadership here in this country. It's been farsighted. And, uh, there are a few historical hangups, but I think, uh, uh, Wisdom will prevail. There was a question. There are a couple of questions in the back. Michael Bordoff first. No, no. So Michael Berda, Humboldt University, uh, Berlin. You talk about the um, the failures of Germany. It's interesting to think about the position here, which is more about the failures of Southern Europe to reform their economies. So the the view in Germany is that it's not just demand; it's also supply. And the Germans solved the supply problem in 2003 when they did the Hartz reforms and fixed the labor markets. So what's your view on the failures of Southern Europe to get their act together, to get their labor markets moving again? Because that's part of the growth formula. It's not just demand. It's got to be getting people to work again. I absolutely agree. Uh, in a longer version of this, I would have dwelled on that to some extent. I wanted purposely to focus on Germany and German policy tonight. But you're absolutely right, of course. The deficit countries have to do their part. I'll mention the United States as well. But within Europe, uh, certainly you're absolutely right. What I do worry about is that putting total reliance on the supply response from the deficit countries means A, a very long-term process because we know that those structural reforms, even the Hartz reforms, took quite a long time to play through to economic results. And secondly, in the meanwhile, and maybe even at the end of the day, if demand is still inadequate, you're going to have very low growth. And then the reform process may actually be discredited because a country goes through all the, uh, all the anxiety and the costs of dealing with its structural rigidities, and it doesn't get much, much payoff from it at the end of the day anyway because the demand side is weak. So, absolutely right, you have to do both. But I did want, to, but there's been a lot of stress on the need for the debtor countries to adjust and reform, including structurally. And I say that's exactly right. I think there's been less stress on the need for the surplus side to bring down its surpluses and boost demand. That, of course, is nothing new. That's been, in a way, the bane of the international monetary system since Britain Woods. <laughs> for understandable reasons, there are rules that bite on deficit countries and no rules that really bite at all on surplus countries. Um, but that's a formula for economic costs and even 
new crises and unsustainability. So fully take the point. It's got to have that dimension. But that dimension alone, I think, will not do it. And the, both the perception and to some extent the reality is that that has been, if not the totality of the policy response, at least a very large part of it. As I said, Germany, to its credit, has been willing to finance those countries and put pressure on them to reform. But I just don't think that will be enough for a viable and sustainable uh, long-term outcome. The last role, the gentleman in the dark suit. Hajo Institute for Productionsmanagement. Um, we work with uh, Airbus, VW, and uh, Deutsche Bahn, and particularly their. Uh, oh, yeah. We work with uh, Airbus, VW, and Deutsche Bahn, and particularly their procurement uh, organization and their supply chains. And I, I found your story about Korea particularly interesting, and it leads to my question because. The people that we work with, particularly the procurement directors, um, very much think that the dollar is way too high in respect to the euro, and they are working actively to work against, to offset that um, process with respect to globalization and pushing to build plants and pushing the suppliers to build plants, uh, if we look just at the United States, in order to off that, offset that, especially with respect to Airbus. And I wondered, my question was, um, in that regard, at what point do companies realize that countries are driving the currency exchange rates as an advantage, as Airbus versus Boeing, since all aircraft are sold in dollars, is very much aware of? And my question is, at what point do countries look at currency as a weapon in the process of globalization? Well, nothing new. <laughs> they have been doing it for a long time. And as you're probably aware, there's been quite a, an outburst of uh, debate over the last several years. It's cooled down a little bit lately, but it's been very hot for really the last 10 years about the issue of currency wars. In fact, that's my next book and I'm working on uh, is currency wars in the world economy. Um, China, to take the prototype, has for 10 years, 10 years, been carrying out the most protectionist, mercantilistic economic policy in the history of mankind <laughs> by intervening daily against the dollar to the average of $1 billion per day over a 10-year period. That's how their reserves have gotten to $4 trillion, in order to keep the dollar strong and the renminbi weak for competitive reasons. It is a crime that they've been able to get away with that. The U.S. has mounted some efforts. The Chinese have let the rate move up significantly, though not nearly enough. Their surpluses have come down a lot, but they're still way too high and they're going back up. That is the most extreme example of the currency wars. But less than two years ago, new government comes into office in Japan, Prime Minister Abe. His team, as he's not even taken office yet, dramatically talks down the exchange rate of the yen. Said, oh, well, you know, yen should really be 25, 30% weaker, and we're going to carry out a monetary policy that will achieve that. Well, of course, in retrospect, they say the monetary policy would have done it by itself, but what actually drove it down was the jawboning. And so a lot of people, like the American auto industry, but others as well, got very exercised about that. You can understand why. This is competitive currency depreciation. If there was one lesson for the world economy from the 1930s, if there was one idea that underlay the creation of the Bretton Woods system, it was to avoid a repetition of currency wars and competitive devaluations that would see individual countries trying to steal a march from each other to get out ahead of the competitive game. But then, of course, Eventually, the other guy always emulates and copies, and so at the end of the day, everybody turns out to be a substantial loser. That rule, which was written very explicitly into the Charter of the International Monetary Fund, has never been implemented because it had no enforcement tools and because surplus countries come under no market pressure to deal with their currency problems. Therefore, the United States, on a couple of occasions, has broken a lot of crockery. <laughs> 
a uh, long time ago, John Connolly, Richard Nixon, um, devalued the dollar against uh, gold, put on an import surcharge to enable them to negotiate a dollar devaluation because they felt that was the only way to do it, and they were probably right. In the mid-1980s, Jim Baker called the Plaza Agreement because the dollar had gotten so hugely overvalued. At that time, there was good international cooperation, actually, to bring the dollar down, and those nicks came along a little later, as I said. Um, but the international system has failed dramatically to deal with that central problem. And therefore, the temptation for individual countries to try to unilaterally strengthen their competitive position by currency undervaluations is still very strong. And in periods of weak economic performance, like the Great Recession we've just come through, is when it really breaks out. So, the finance minister of Brazil in 2010 was talking about currency wars having broken out. We documented in a study that I published uh, about that time over 20 countries that were really systematically, systematically intervening, manipulating the exchange rates in order to undervalue their currencies. The issue is a little esoteric for many people. It's politically, of course, very sensitive for G7, G20. Uh, it has been addressed, but not yet effectively. In the German case that I talked about today, there's this additional layer of difficulty, namely that Germany does not have its own exchange rate. It's part of the euro. So now you have to figure a way to determine whether the exchange rate of the euro is really truly reflecting the individual currencies and whether internal adjustment within the eurozone can take place on the same basis that international adjustment between countries with their own currencies should take place. Your suppliers have a valid point, a valid fear. Uh, if this issue that I'm talking about today in Europe, the global issue that I've now mentioned in addition, are not dealt with in a more constructive and cooperative way, I think we inevitably face the risk of very severe currency wars. Countries will be sorely tempted to seek advantage through unilateral steps. We'll get more John Connollys, and if we don't uh, deal with it in a more collaborative way, uh, I'm afraid that's one major risk that not just your suppliers, but all of us will have to face. Okay, let's move a little further from Klaus Deutsch. Yeah, Klaus Deutsch from Deutsche Bank. Uh, if you compare the performance of the United States and the euro area to the uh, financial crisis, there's a stark difference in how you treat bad debt on both sides of the Atlantic. And uh, in Europe, it's often underrated how much the Federal Reserve actually intervened into the uh, resolution of debt crises in the United States that, of course, came from real estate but also affected households, banks, and uh, property developers. Now, if you look at the European situation, we are pretty tough on these debtors, and uh, the ECB hasn't taken much off the balance sheet of these southern European countries, which is why they are not really moving ahead and not having a lot of investment in the uh, tradable sector. What is uh, your view, uh, also given the experience of Japan and other over indebted countries of the past, how one would deal with such a situation even five years into the crisis? Well, I think it would be hard to underestimate the uh, intervention of the Federal Reserve. Its uh, balance sheet is up to $4 trillion, and it's rising by another still $60, $65 billion per month. And now, now we're down to 45. We're now tapering, tapering. We're, so, we're, we're only doing $45 billion per month. That's a little, it's about a billion and a half dollars a day. Uh, it's, uh, it's still more than small change. It's coming down, but the balance sheet's to $4 trillion. And it's huge. And so there's been massive intervention by the Federal Reserve, no question about it. Um, and the Bank of Japan, which was also not doing too much of that, uh, has now uh, is catching up with a vengeance with uh, the monetary policy under Kuroda and, and under the Abe administration. Um, in terms of trying to offer stimulus to its own economy, it's definitely true what you say, the European Central Bank has been the least aggressive. Rightly or wrongly, one could argue it both ways, but I would say the European Central Bank has been the least aggressive. The steps today move, I think, significantly in the direction of, uh, of strengthening that support. 
But it may well be that with the U.S. having gone through much of what you said and now tapering down, and the ECB coming along later in the process and now easing, while the U.S. is reducing its easing, we may get a very big exchange rate effect. Now we could get a very large exchange rate effect and the euro could come down very substantially against the dollar. Depending on the follow through in Frankfurt, uh, what happens in, implement, in implementing the new strategy, how fast the U.S. tapers through the Fed and all that. But I think we could have a very big exchange rate effect. And some people, I can assure you, will regard that as a competitive devaluation by Europe. Now, I would actually not regard it that way, partly because our analyses show that the euro-dollar rate is not that far from equilibrium now, and the euro could actually come down a little bit uh, without violating uh, equilibrium principles. But what happens at the margin is key, and if the euro does come down substantially and the dollar were to then go into a generalized increase, some of our people would sound like Helmut Schmidt sounded back in the 1970s and 80s that you know, we were being disadvantaged by the exchange rate. When the Japanese did what they did 18 months ago, there were screams from the American automobile industry, other manufacturers in the United States who compete with Japan, screaming competitive devaluation. Uh, and it was ultimately done through monetary policy. So the risk that I mentioned is, uh, is with us and could happen again, though I do support, as I said earlier, a move by the European Central Bank to promote more domestic demand increase in Europe. Quantitative easing by the Fed, the Bank of Japan, has, I think, rightly been regarded around the world as a legitimate policy tool. It's carried out basically to promote domestic demand. It's carried out in domestic instruments. It's very different from direct intervention in the currency markets like the Chinese have done. But there is an effect on the exchange rate, and so that will lead to perceptions and criticism. Uh, and I hope this does not lead to another uh, another round of uh, currency war scares. Okay. More questions? Yes. Why don't you hand them out? Yes. Bernard Spey of the Berlin Center of Finance. Um, can I suggest to you that the task lying ahead of the German government is actually even more complicated than you sketched out? And let me explain why. My reading of the euro crisis is actually that it is a case of an abject failure of macroprudential policies, because in the initial years of the EMU, obviously, real interest rates were too low for the southern European countries. And uh, they should have been running uh, fiscal surpluses to, to counteract that in, in spirit of macroprudential policies, with, uh, which, with the exception, laudable exception of Ireland and, and Spain, to some extent, they didn't. Um, now, I would argue that in, in some sense, Germany finds itself in that situation at, at the moment where real interest rates really are, are too low uh, for the strengths of the German economy. And really what the German government should be doing is uh, trying to aim for a fiscal surplus, if, if that was the case. Um, now, that obviously runs counter to, uh, to, to your idea of stimulating demand in, in the German economy. Um, so uh, the policy response, if, if that line of argumentation was correct, would be that, the, yes, there is indeed a need to, to stimulate domestic demand, but not by simply uh, pushing up fiscal uh, deficits, but rather by uh, shifting demand structures uh, towards domestic consumption, which obviously is, is a far harder task uh, than simply pushing up fiscal deficits. Would you agree? Uh, certainly, I would agree that should be a major dimension of the program. Uh, I did say rather quickly in passing, that there was an asymmetry between the pressure on the deficit countries in Europe to undertake structural reform, which we discussed, and what many would argue is an absence of structural reform of late in the surplus countries, including Germany, like the services sector, like some of the financial arrangements, various elements of the German economy, which if they were reformed, in the same spirit of the Hartz reforms of labor a decade or so ago, could stimulate, as you said, more consumer demand, more imports, more growth that would be imparted to the rest of Europe. Uh, that would certainly be highly desirable and a vital part of any overall strategy of the type that I mentioned. So I fully, fully accept your, your amendment to that. Um, on your first point about uh, the deficit countries and the 
origins of the crisis, macroprudential problems. Um, again, I agree in large part, but I would have one important difference in interpretation. Uh, the markets made huge errors in treating Greek debt like German debt. And that meant interest rates in Greece and the other peripheral countries were way below what they should have been in light of the fiscal positions, but the overall economies of those countries. So the market sent hugely misleading signals to those countries. And you're, of course, right. They should have used it to run fiscal surpluses and to invest in their infrastructure and do all the right things. But it's a little hard to attack people too strongly for living beyond their means when it's so cheap to do so. So the markets, the great omnipotent, far-seeing markets, uh, send some very, very perverse signals. And it's in that sense, only in that sense, but in that sense, I have some sympathy for the countries that got into this crisis. Uh, they should have known better, but they were misled, and uh, uh, a lot of people were cheering them on to, uh, uh, to borrow that money and uh, use it in ways that were not so, uh, so sound. Uh, more questions? Yes, maybe. Take the last question. Uh, yeah, uh, Bernard Mohamed, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, visiting one of our favorite cities right now. Uh, if expansion succeeds, as you call for, and considering the interest rate issue that was just raised, uh, mightn't that lead to higher interest rates uh, that would put pressure on sovereign debt and you're back into another crisis that uh, we sort of got out of recently? Well, if we got faster growth, uh, sure, it would put some upper pressure on interest rates. Uh, I'd be happy to take that trade off right now. But in addition, interest rates are coming from such a low level uh, throughout Europe, also in the United States, Japan, around the world. Interest rates are at abnormally low levels. And we cannot view those as anything like equilibrium for the longer run. I mean, those distortions will lead to other big problems that beyond the scope of today's discussion. But uh, we should not, I think, uh, uh, be reluctant to achieve pickup in real growth uh, because it might lead to higher interest rates. There'll be plenty of time. It's the same as the fear that it'll trigger inflation. And again, inflation is nowhere to be seen. Uh, and there will be, as Ben Bernanke repeatedly said, Janet Yellen has said, all the leading central bankers rightly say, uh, there'll be plenty of time to reverse gears and head off a new risk of inflation and higher interest rates if that were to happen. So of the things that keep me awake at night, that's the least. <laughs> and I would, not, uh, I would not be deterred by that concern. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to conclude the uh, Q&A session now. Let me thank Fred Bergson again for an inspiring Kurt Firmitz lecture and for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom with us during the uh, discussion. And if I'm not mistaken, there may be drinks served outside as it's getting increasingly warm. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.